good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this webinar, which is held by the Institute for North American and European Studies, University of Tehran. So the topic is going to be on the war in Ukraine and collapsing law orders. Uh, and I'm actually honored to host uh, my very distinguished panelist, Alistair Krug, who is a, a former EU negotiator and founder and director of Conflict Forum. And he has this um, um, very informative blog, Resistance, the Essence of Islamic Revolution, which provides background on the Islamic revolutions in the Middle East. We have also Scott Reeder, who is a former U.S. Marine Intelligence Officer and Chief UN Weapon Inspector. And he has his recent book on Scorpion King, America's Suicidal Embrace of Nuclear Weapons, from FDR to Trump. And it provides a vivid and detailed history of America's deceptive use of arms of actually threatening its quest for nuclear dominance. We also have Max Blumenthal, who is an American journalist and author and blogger and editor of the, of the Gray Zone. And his recent book is The uh, Management of Savagery, How America's National Security State Will Devise About Biden, ISIS, and Donald Trump. He has also written on, in Daily Beast, The Nation, which is about English, Los Angeles Times, and Washington Monthly. And then we have uh, Sayyid Mohammed Mirandi, who is a professor of English literature and American studies at the University of Tehran. He has appeared as political commentator on international news networks such as PBS, RT, uh, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, and Press TV. Um, thank you again for accepting our invitation. So, and I will hand over the panel to Dr. Mirandi. Thank you very much. And thank all of you. I have to thank all of you for accepting this invitation because I know for Max it's early in the morning. I know that Alistair has had uh, a tough time and uh, today getting around and uh, I know that Scott has many things to do because he's all over the place because of um, his problems with Twitter. So we'll get to that shortly. I just wanted to uh, raise a few questions and then we'll have a discussion. We'll move from one person to another. And uh, and I'll make some comments of my own, although I'm sure that uh, they are of much lesser value than uh, the guests. My question is, let's steer away from Ukraine for a moment. What is going to happen? What implications is this going to happen? for the whole of Europe and the world. I, I want to go back to Ukraine. I want to discuss Ukraine. But what do you think this is going to lead to? And I, I'd like to begin with Alistair. Well, that's a very big question that uh, you put uh, for us. Um, uh, well, let's just, let's just go back very clearly and say what's happening because it's important just to state it, because uh, you rightly say Ukraine tends to sort of occupy everything, the space, and push out the wider picture, which is that Russia and China jointly, as a single team, have decided, and they decided this perhaps a year ago, but at least some time ago, that they were going to challenge and change the global order, the US hegemonic global order by which the US sets the rules and sets the cultural context for the world. And Ukraine was the sort of first step in this process. But make, let's make it absolutely clear, this was just a first step, an important one because it would actually define the issue, one key issue, which was pushing back the whole of NATO's expansion from 1991 right up uh, to the borders and to begin a sort of stealth NATOization of Ukraine, which is what has been going on during this period. I mean, trainers, equipment, uh, institutions, NATO has been all over Ukraine, but not formally there, informally there. So. Uh, this is really the point at which we are. And of course, a number of things are implicit in this um, challenge to the global order. One is the separation of the globe into two distinct spheres, 
two quite separate spheres. Um, one of them, quite a small one, being the American and what sort of a tiny rump of Europe um, it will be. And then you'll have another wider one, which will be led by uh, the R Russia China team, as the Chinese foreign minister keeps calling it, and the expansion. And this is important because it's the expansion of that whole market, economic market, through Asia. The Belt and Road, but more than that, the Shanghai cooperation part of it, the um, Eurasian economic community, all of these elements, the BRICS, all of these elements into a, a new separate economic sphere with a different monetary system, a different financial settlement system for trade um, and uh, operating to a key precepts, one of which is respect for each other's sovereignty which is something that has been completely lost at this point. Respect for each other's sovereignty, a sense in which um, you should do your, you know, your, your politics according to your own cultural norms. I mean, Western has its sort of democracy, not much democracy in it, but it calls it liberal democracy. Fine, have that. China and you know, Russia feels they do their own political structures, their own political systems in their own cultural way. So that would be the, I, I think, the, the, the second thing. And then the third thing is uh, to respect separate cultures and that these cultures are important and valuable in themselves and that they underpin community and they underpin ethical values something again which is sort of left out of all the descriptions of it because actually when you talk about culture you go back if you like to uh, Homer and all of the Greek stories I mean all of these are the archetypal moral stories the archetypal tales that give a society if you like its moral ethical skeleton I'm not talking about a formal religion, but I'm talking about something that gives community a sense of belonging, a sense of being a community, and a sense of having a purpose and a direction and certain standards in it, of which people are proud to adhere to. So it's about finding self-esteem. So I think that is one of the elements. And then lastly, can, because I want I to stop... I'll stop there. Just let me finish the last bit and then I'll, you can put someone else on. But I mean, I think the last bit, and then we can develop it later, is a different economic model implicit in that. A very different economic model from the Western neoliberal economic model. So both Russia, China, it won't, it's not a one size fits all economic model, but a very different model with different objectives in it. Mohammed, sorry. Uh, my question was that so globalism has come to an end. Uh, the globe is the world is fragmented. Uh, do you think and so sovereignty of nations is going to become more important again? But in this, as the world advances, as with the new technologies, and uh, this is no longer the 19th or 20th century. It's a it's a time when the weapon systems are far more advanced, far more dangerous. Uh, they can reach their destinations immediately. You have cyber warfare. In this break, how much more dangerous does it become? Do we move towards a, a, a multipolar uh, world, a bipolar world? Is it more chaotic? It is, is it more dangerous? Is it a good thing? I mean, I, I think all of us would agree that the current world order is uh, not something that the most of the world would want but is this transition going to lead us and i know no one can predict but do you think it will be leading us to something much worse or does it bring about does it have is it dangerous but does it bring about new opportunities serious opportunities god well you <laughs> you sort of pulled together a lot of different things in that collection. 
Um, so I'm going to have to treat them very sort of uh, sort of superficially in, in that sense. Um, yeah, the if you like the split. First of all, we're going to have two separate global um, spheres. Maybe we'll have more. I mean, maybe the some of those spheres will split again, and we'll have a much more diverse. I think overall we're going back to a sort of com a concert of Europe, 19th century sort of political structure of the sort of big nations and then the little nations probably not really participating much in that sort of type of structure. But um, yes, is it going to be chaotic? Um, is it going to be dangerous was your first question, sorry. I think you've said the wrong thing actually, Mohammed. The, I think, yes, of course there is the danger of weapons and hypersonic missiles and nuclear weapons. Actually, the most dangerous thing is the psyche of the West. I think this is the greatest danger to it all, because can the West cope and accept its um, implied demise as the sort of global leader? Psychologically, it's going to be extremely difficult for the West to cope with, 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 with that. Um, and I believe that is going to cause a lot of problems. I just give you a quick example. When, when after the, the Second European War, everyone could see that Britain was completely weakened by it. financially, financially, economically, it lost all its gold reserves, they were on their way to America. And I remember the cabinet, who, man who was the cabinet secretary, said to me at the time, Look, you know, we have cabinet meeting after cabinet meeting after cabinet meeting, and there's just one item on the agenda. It never changes. Same agenda. And we spend the whole day talking about it. And what was on that agenda? How not to look weak when all the world can see that the world has changed dramatically and you are a lot weaker. And that, I think, is a great danger to facing us. How is the Western psyche capable of making this transition to get away from the idea that they have a, a, a sort of messianic right um, to, to, to um, lead and guide the rest of the world and the rest of the world's people um, by them. I don't know. That's a question others might care to have a comment on. That. OK, Scott, how about yourself? What do you agree, disagree? What would you like to add to what Alice First of all, I agree 100%. Um, and I, I think Alistair's done a very good job of framing the um, the global geopolitical new reality that uh, the world is facing. Uh, and and, and I, I will also reiterate the point he's made. When we say the world is facing, um, there's a lot of denial. <laughs> a lot of denial in the United States, a lot of denial in Europe. Um, uh, and then I would also say that there's, uh, in the rest of the world, uh, guarded optimism, meaning they haven't quite accepted the um, the reality that this is in fact going to happen. Um, you know, they they heard Putin, they heard uh, uh, President Xi Jinping speak, uh, they've read the, the 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 statement put out, but uh, translating uh, these actions into reality is something I think that um, uh, there's a, a good part of the world that uh, is is. A little skeptical whether or not this this can happen. So um, even though I think this is a fait accompli, I think it's going to happen. I think Russia and China are serious about this. There's um, a lot of denial and a lot of skepticism out there. So there's a there's going to be some struggle ahead to um, to get people to come on board and whether they come board, on board kicking and screaming or have to be pushed or uh, you know a helping hand uh, put out to drag them in. Uh, we'll we'll see. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, move away from that because there's literally no no daylight between Alistair and I on this. Uh, and I'll talk about the, what, what I call the middle aspect of this. And Alistair touched on that, the European security framework. And I, I, I think when people focus on Ukraine, they, they miss the picture. Ukraine is not the end. Ukraine is a means. It's a means of initiating a process of change in Europe that realigns the European security framework in a manner that is acceptable to Russia. Not that doesn't represent Russian dominance of Europe, anything but. What it does, however, represent is Russian security. 
Um, and, you know, Russia gave Europe and the United States every opportunity to resolve this issue diplomatically. And I'm not talking about the seven years that Russia was pushed into a corner. I'm talking about the treaties that Russia put on the table in December of last year. These were serious documents, serious treaties, and the West dismissed them. Guess what? Those treaties have not gone away. They still exist. Those are the official Russian position. Read them and you'll understand what must happen before Russia stops doing what it's doing. And if you think that Ukraine, which was defined as a military technical operation, um, represents the only for, uh, the only mechanism of armed conflict in Europe, you don't know what you're talking about. Finland is about to find out a harsh truth that you don't enter into a decades long pact of guaranteed neutrality with Russia, formerly the Soviet Union. Um, one which allows you to peacefully coexist in close proximity to St. Petersburg, one that allows you to peacefully coexist in close proximity to the Kola Peninsula, and then suddenly back away from that without suffering serious ramifications. And what I mean by serious ramifications is just like the NATOized Ukrainian army was deemed to be an existential threat to Russia, any Finnish military force that's part of NATO that is physically in the proximity of St. Petersburg must be eliminated. Must be eliminated. There's, there's literally no debate about this. Any Finnish force that can be seen as threatening the Kola Peninsula will be eliminated. Russia cannot allow this to happen. And again, I go back to a statement that Vladimir Putin said. He said, we will accomplish every objective we have set out to accomplish. There's no flexibility here. There's no negotiating room. He didn't go in high and willing to negotiate lower. This is the Russian position. And if Finland thinks it's going to join NATO at the Madrid NATO summit this June, I believe we're in for a very hot summer, one that involves the Russians destroying Finland as a modern nation state in the same way they've destroyed Ukraine as a modern nation state. It's not something Russia wants to do, but it's the inevitable outcome of a European nation allowing itself to be used by NATO. And that's what's happening here. Used by NATO to pose an existential threat to Russia. It's part of this overall design of containing and weakening Russia. It, that game's over. It's a whole new game called Russia is going to go to war. And that's just the reality. It's a harsh reality. It's a sad reality. But I don't see Russia deviating from that at all. Um, and it's not just Russia. Understand that <laughs> Putin and uh, Xi Jinping met in Beijing on February 4th, where they issued this joint statement, 5,000 plus words. On January 28th or 29th, I can't remember which date, the, uh, the Chinese ambassador of the United States gave an interview to National Public Radio where he said, if the United States doesn't basically tone down what it's doing in the Pacific, it is inevitable that China and the United States will go to war over Taiwan, inevitable. That's a bold statement, one that he, an ambassador does not make on his own. That means he is reflecting Chinese official policy. Now, that statement was made in an environment where war was still considered to be this this abstract notion, you know, Russia had not yet invaded Ukraine. And many people believed that it was impossible for Russia to invade Ukraine because of what it would do to Europe and the European economic security, the European framework, all this. Well, guess what? Russia went to war with Ukraine and all that shredded. It's gone, finished. It's a whole new world. And China looked at it and said, maybe it's time that we take that step on Taiwan. Taiwan's days are numbered. And that's the other lesson that's coming out of this. I believe that China will make a move on Taiwan. Now, Taiwan can decide whether they want to take the pre-war Zelensky uh, um, out from war, that is accepting um, what are non-negotiable demands, or they can do the post-Zelensky um, uh, scenario, which is to be crushed and have demands dictated to you um, and lose your nation, lose your economy, and lose tens if not hundreds of thousands of people in the process. It's Taiwan's choice, but there is no fact that I believe Taiwan has been emboldened by this, not just because of uh, Russia's looming military success, 
but because of the impotence of the West, literally the impotence of the West. The West barks loudly. It has no bite. There is no military capability in NATO. None. It's, it's, it's non-existent. It's a joke. That's why NATO is panicking right now. They're, they're talking about spending hundreds of billions of dollars to build a military capability. Where are they going to get that money in a collapsing economy? Where are they going to get the political will? What happens on April 24th if Marie Le Pen wins the election in France? And France says, we're not playing the NATO game anymore. And when France walks, all of NATO walks except Poland and the Baltics. Germany ain't sticking around. Italy ain't sticking around. Spain ain't sticking around. They may stick around as members, but they're not going to be playing the military game. And I want to remind everybody that Article 5, you know, the, uh, the, the attack against one is an attack against all, is a fantasy. Read it very carefully. It doesn't say if you attack one NATO member, they all automatically come rushing with everything they got to defend you. It says they will consider it. They will consider it and they might respond militarily. They might not. And if NATO structures itself so that it is allowing a handful of nations like Poland and the Baltics to position them for the destruction of Europe, the rest of Europe's not going to follow. And China's looking at this, looking at the sanctions, because everybody was afraid of the big sanctions. What happens when they impose total sanctions? Well, Russia has shown what happens. Now, I'll tell you who's smarter about the global economy than Vladimir Putin. That's Xi Jinping. The Chinese are the global economy. And if, <laughs> if the United States wants to try and sanction that, uh, the pushback will be even greater. But I think China has been emboldened by what Russia is doing. And, um, I, I think that we're going to, as, as Alistair said, in this restructuring that's taking place, the military technical option um, is, is becoming the option of choice because the West doesn't take diplomacy seriously. Now, if the West were serious diplomatic uh, counterparts who would sit down at a table and negotiate in good faith, I don't believe either China or Russia would seek war because war is destructive. War is harmful. It, 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 it's hurting Russia badly. But because the United States and Europe have proven to be not only bad negotiators, but they just refused to negotiate, this was the only option. And in the Pacific, um, I, I, I think China's confronted the same thing. The United States is not a faithful negotiating partner. The United States lies. The United States changes its mind every presidential election. Um, it's inconsistent. And the allies they bring to it are weak. And the problem with weak allies is they can't act on their own. They therefore take their lead from the nation they perceive to be strong, which is the United States, who isn't strong, either military, militarily, or economically. So that's what I would add to Alistair, is that I think that there's going to be significant regional realignment uh, designed to uh, remake the security framework in Europe and in Asia, and that uh, Russia and China will both um, be using um, military technical means, meaning war, as a means of um, pursuing their objectives, because the West won't give them any other alternative. Okay, so Max, uh, you heard what uh, Scott and Alistair said. My question is whether the United States really sees it this way. I mean, right now what we are seeing is the result of U.S. policy in Europe, the United States lied. They uh, moved eastward towards the Russian border. We all know about the coup, the crushing of the Russian Ukrainians with NATO support, the building up of a semi-NATO force in Ukraine to aggrieve Russia. Now Russia is pushing back, whether we like it or not. Uh, but what I, the way I see it is that if if the Russians are going to be more assertive and Obviously, uh, when they initiate a war with Ukraine, there's no reason why they would feel that their security is not being threatened by other neighbors who want to join NATO, NATO and that they would not respond similarly. But if China is going to be more assertive as well, Russia, going, is, if it's going to be more assertive as well, then why is the United States pushing this policy? Why does it want to get more and more when it's seeing a rising anger in, in its rival countries. 
Well, I'll address that briefly. I actually wanted to go back to your first question, Mohammed. Um, but just uh, to that point, I think the foreign policy establishment in Washington is delusional, and those delusions were expressed by President Joe Biden during his speech in Poland, where he was said to have gone off script and was overly candid when he said this man must not stay in power, referring to Vladimir Putin, and essentially called for regime change in Moscow. And the Maidan coup in 2014, everything that precipitated that, that coup and everything that's happened since, which has been guided by the United States and Ukraine, has been done with the fantasy of regime change in mind. Uh, this fantasy was expressed in the Washington Post in, I believe, 2015 by Carl Gershman, the head of the National Endowment for Democracy, who is, which is the regime change arm of the U.S. government, funded, I believe, through the State Department. And this fantasy has been entertained by the political director or, or political advisor to the State Department, Victoria Newland, who is the wife of Robert Kagan, the arch neoconservative who spelled out the blueprint for American domination of the globe, total domination, what he called he and his co-author uh, neocon William Crystal called benevolent hegemony, that the U.S. will be a benevolent world dictator. And that document formed the basis of the project for a new American century, which represented a series of open letters signed on by bigwigs in the Washington um, foreign policy establishment, particularly on the neocon side, calling for regime change in Iran, Iraq, all across the Middle East, anywhere an independent government existed. So this is still present. This thinking is still present in Washington, despite the reality on the ground. And when it comes to Ukraine, the thinking goes that Ukraine, if it becomes NATOized, will force Russia to concentrate so much of its military and security uh, resources on its own frontiers that it will begin to weaken Russia internally and that the U.S. can kind of create this pressure cooker effect uh, through this kind of new containment doctrine to spawn regime change through a color revolution, that the citizenry in Russia will become deeply frustrated and will begin protesting against Putin. And just being in the United States, you can turn on CNN, turn on MSNBC, particularly those channels, also uh, Fox News, which represents the Republican establishment. And you'll see these rented generals and various security figures who all have ties to the arms industry uh, entertaining these fantasies that Putin will be overthrown imminently. Uh, one figure Jeremy Bash, he is the former CIA chief of staff to Barack Obama, and he is now a contributor on the MSNBC network, which speaks for the Democratic Party. He said that he wants to see a new Charlie Wilson's war in Ukraine, and that refers to the CIA-backed proxy war in Afghanistan to support the Mujahideen through Operation Cyclone, which at the time was the most expensive covert operation in CIA history. And the idea is Russian helicopters will begin falling out of the sky. This proxy war will bleed Russia from its soft underbelly. The Ukrainians will emerge as the heroic Mujahideen will actually the neo-Nazi Azov battalion will be our our our, our white uh, white supremacist Mujahideen. And Putin's regime will collapse. So the fantasy actually is not a direct military confrontation, but fighting this war down to the last Ukrainian. And the U.S. mainstream media has been um, entertaining or actually marketing this idea among within you know the domestic population, particularly those who read the papers, who represent kind of the intelligentsia, people who are older, that the Russian military is suffering one devastating defeat after another in Ukraine, and that its withdrawal from the Kiev Oblast represents a major blow to Putin uh, domestically, that Putin is paranoid and surrounded by a small coterie of advisors, that he's shouting at everyone, that he has lost his resolve. And so they think that they are actually achieving some of their goals. 
I don't think that it really re reflects the, the reality on the ground. And this goes to your first question, Mohammed, about um, how this war is affecting the West. Scott could actually speak to this, but as we all know, um, and your audience should know, Scott was removed from, I think, the main social media platform in the United States where policy is discussed and influenced. Uh, it is a central arena for hybrid warfare, and that is Twitter. It's not the most popular social media platform, but it's where all the policy specialists, experts, pundits, and the people who follow them go to debate. And Scott was removed for challenging the official narrative around the photographs of deaths in a city, a small city in the Kiev Oblast called Bucha, where we have been fed a steady diet of atrocity exhibition here in the United States from this city in order to justify removing Russia from the UN Human Rights Council to justify new sanctions and to justify the charge of genocide against Russia, which was just issued by Joseph Biden echoing Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. And Scott's removal from Twitter has been of a part with the removal of many, many popular accounts that were challenging the official narrative around Russia, Ukraine. And that represents a new policy in which Twitter is essentially allowing one side to openly lie. You have Ukrainian officials openly lying on Twitter and suppressing those who question the lies or who offer a different version of events on the grounds that it is disinformation. Twitter has aligned itself first with the Democratic Party in the United States, but it is also being guided and influenced by the security services, the Five Eyes Security Services, and specifically in the United States, the State Department, and the and U.S. intelligence. It is a American platform, a, a platform for Washington. And that really shows where we are going in the West when it comes to speech. We are experiencing a decoupling, not just economically from Russia and China, but a media and information decoupling. The United States it seeks to establish a great American firewall and prevent the free flow of information from countries and even uh, dissident people inside its own realm to its population from countries that are independent or that don't exist within the U.S. sphere of influence. Why is that? It's because the U.S. government and specifically the part of the government that is not elected, uh, but which carries power from administration to administration, has lost the consent of the governed. This country is more polarized than ever, and an entire sector of the population has lost faith in the establishment. And therefore, that segment of the American public represents the greatest, a much greater threat to the establishment than Russia or China, and they are afraid that more of the public will simply begin to see that the U.S. empire no longer is what it once was, that the war is not going the way that they would like them to believe, that Ukraine is not actually this wonderful democracy. It's a deeply repressive state, that their tax dollars are paying for weapons for neo-Nazis and so on. So. We are now losing, I think, the most important component of American exceptionalism right before our eyes. We're watching it dissolve. And that is freedom of speech and our constitutional rights. And so many people here know that. And when the United States freely gives up these qualities, that it would use to portray itself as a shining city on a hill, it loses the power that it once had to lecture countries around the globe and to market itself to, for example, Eastern European former Soviet satellites as they were brought into the NATO fold and offered NATO membership. And so I think this will 
prompt a deeper kind of cultural and political crisis within Europe as Europe is forced to decide if it wants to continue along the path into an American future as the United States descends into infighting, polarization, and authoritarianism under the Democratic Party. Well, okay, well, that 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 sounds dangerous. But uh, I, I want to actually get to Bucha a, a bit later because uh, I read the New York Times version of the story. And one thing that definitely doesn't fit for me, who's experienced war, and I've seen a lot of war, is, and that is that they uh, claimed that the bodies were there for uh, a long period of time, I think maybe 10 days, two weeks. That's just simply not possible in, at this time of year. Uh, that the bodies have to be buried within hours. Otherwise, they'd be a, a big problem. But I, I'll get to that later, uh, especially because I think one reason why Scott was removed from Twitter was because of uh, this particular atrocity and uh, his uh, belief about who carried it out. But Alistair, I, I, one thing I re remember about Alistair is that we were in Beirut together in late 2011. I recall he said to me that this, this, the the war on Syria is a is a uh, is a is a dirty war, and that it's a sort of it's a regime change war. And I said, how, how, why do you think so? And Alistair said that because all the people who I knew of in Af in Pakistan and Afghanistan are now in Istanbul. I, I always remember him saying that. But Alistair, you know a thing or two about Afghanistan, to say the least. Why wouldn't this work? I mean, this. Uh, why can't Ukraine be an Afghanistan for Russia? Uh, because Afghanistan was not Afghanistan for Russia in the first place. Because uh, I was, I suppose, one of the implementers uh, of Charlie Wilson's war. Uh, and I just want to make it very clear. Um, the Soviet Union was not defeated by the introduction of stingers. It was not defeated by the Mujahideen. In fact, it, the Mujahideen were in a deep crisis in, in the year before um, the uh, eventual implosion. And what we saw, and I mean people, American diplomats, um, the famous American diplomat many years ago suggested that the Soviet Union could implode under the weight of its own inherent flaws. That's what happened. So it wasn't, if you like, a quagmire in Afghanistan. In fact, the Soviets had really just introduced new measures in Afghanistan, which were very effective. The Spetsnaz was going in, they were using new, new measures. It was the internal flaws that caused the Soviet Union, flaws which don't exist. Uh, today. So I don't think that, you know, the quagmire thing is necessarily the right example. I, I mean, they're using it mistakenly. Um, secondly, because, you know, uh, also because Ukraine is very different. You had the material within, if you like, Afghanistan for insurgency. But you don't really have that. The insurgencies that have taken place, and I think I recall that Scott has said this quite loudly and people have had to listen this, actually most of the insurgencies have failed uh, that were attempted in Ukraine uh, at various times, that they haven't been successful. But I want to go back just a little bit because of something that um, Max said about this and about Twitter and how sad it was that no one you know, wasn't on Twitter an anymore. I, you know, I, I'm not on Twitter, but I think there's a fundamental thing that was implicit in what he was saying. It's as if, um, you know, there could be a debate in the US. And if Twitter wasn't there and other things, then that debate wouldn't happen. And I challenge that because, you know, I've spent years, I mean, even started that in Afghanistan. Um, you remember, in 2006, I remember the, uh, an, uh, you know, one of the neocon people saying very explicitly and explicitly to me, listen, when it comes to, you know, tweaking the humanitarian, the hard strings, we write the script. We are the filmmakers. We are the team that is going to produce the film. 
we direct the film, we distribute the film, and the other side just has to sit quietly in silence and fume with anger because they can do nothing about it. And when we see, I mean, these things are intended for that purpose. There's not supposed to be a debate about all of these, you know, uh, 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 these atrocities, claimed atrocities coming one after the other. Of course, they're going to shut it down. They're not intended. This is part of an imaginary war that is being a psyops war. It is totally divorced from the real war and intended to be a vehicle for undermining Russian um, morale, sense of confidence. In fact, it's been, again, a great mistake because it's had exactly the opposite effect in Russia amongst Russians. The outpouring of hatred and loathing for Russia itself and Russians, let alone for Putin, has absolutely united even the parts of Russia that were sort of proto Atlanticist, shall we say, all of those, you know, certain academic circles now fully behind Putin. Putin enjoys 83% support for it. There's no sign of it lacking. In fact, the more that Russia is denigrated, the greater the sort of insults held at Russia, the stronger the determination to go on and crush any opposition in Ukraine. And I put this you know, because we're talking about war now, and psychology of war is different from the psychology of diplomacy. I mean, people have shifted in in Russia. When there was a sense that there might be some negotiated settlement, there was a great pushback in Russia. People said, no, we want capitulation. We don't want a, a, a nice little tidy agreement that is done by the negotiating team in Istanbul. We want capitulation. Why? Because they've seen all those videos that you don't see in the West of Russian prisoners of wars lying bound on the ground while someone fires a bullet through their kneecap, through their hip bone, and they writhe in agony until the pain almost kills them or does kill them from that and bleeding. Those things have gone all around Russia. So those are the atrocities that have really, if you like, had effect. Whereas these imaginary ones are so obviously faked. I mean, some of them are just badly done, it seems to me. Someone joked the other day, you know, with, with you know, the new chemical weapons in uh, Mariupol, you know, people were complaining that they were coughing and had a headache. Well, you know, perhaps they hadn't had the third vaccination for um, COVID, I don't know. But, you know, none the, you know, they brought in, you know, let's not call them the white helmets per se, but they brought in the white helmets. We know from Syria what this is about. It's not about discussions. It's not about, it's about just simply creating a sense of horror amongst the Western audience of outrage, of a demand for punishment on Russia, a demand for Putin to stand trial and to make Putin so toxic. And this is where there's a sort of mythical idea in the West still, that if, if everyone in Russia understands Putin is just never going to be acceptable, he's the one who, you know, kills people, a butcher of Ukraine, that some oligarchs will come and push him aside and they'll have a Yeltsin-like figure to come in. they just living in the wrong world. It's not the 70s and 80s in Russia any longer. Those oligarchs are not there. There are oligarchs, but they're different oligarchs, and most of those support Putin com completely. And the people don't, uh, they just really don't buy it. So actually what it does, toxifying Putin, because, you know, OK, you do that, but you cut off the ability to have any diplomatic or political solution by doing it. I saw the same thing when I was dealing with the Middle East, with the Palestinian thing. And the West was always trying to demonize Arafat, cut him off, make him look a fool or an idiot or whatever. And I, I see him and he knew this was happening to him. But at the same time, 
there was only one Palestinian who could actually sign on an agreement with Israel, and that was Arafat. None of the others could have ever signed on it. People may not have liked Arafat, may have found his quirks odd, but he was the only figure who could have the authority to sign on that piece of paper, no one else. And they demonized him and eventually he was killed, he was poisoned and removed from the picture. And what do we have? A completely fragmented, fractionalized Palestinians with no chance of political or a military solution. Well, Scott, I, I'd like to go to Bucho because um, I remember in Syria, I went to Duma, I've been there a few times, and uh, regardless of the fact that the chemical attack in Duma was staged, and uh, Max uh, could probably explain that better than I, uh, one thing that I did notice was that as soon as there were accusations of a chemical attack, the, the Western media, Western governments immediately blamed the Syrian government. Who, and the Syrian government had uh, absolutely no reason to carry out the attacks because they were winning the battle. Why would you carry out a, a stupid attack when you're the winning side? But in any case, as soon as the Syrians uh, saw that this attack had uh, taken place, we, we saw the Americans and the Europeans uh, react, blame the Syrian government, and they began to plan to strike Syria and Syrian government targets. And of course, the targets that were struck, if they were actually chemical weapons, then they would have created catastrophe in themselves. So they knew quite well that they were not striking chemical weapons. But this is very, for me, it's very similar to what happened in Bukha. As in, immediately after the, the bodies were found, the Russians were blamed uh, by everyone. The new sanctions were imposed and the Russians were demonized and not just the Russian government, but Russians in general. I, I think we all, as Alistair was pointing out, uh, that uh, it's not just about Putin. You, the, the narrative is, is, is very racist and hostile. So I, I was thinking, it just, you know, just thinking aloud, what do you think? What, what, and what, what do you think about Bucha? Well, to understand Bucha, we have to understand the, um, I think the, the framework, the operational framework that it t took place in. Um, Bucha occurred at the tail end of, fa of, the, of phase one or in the midst of the transition between phase one and phase two of, the, of, a, of a Russian military operation. Um, you know, the West had been told that the Russians had been defeated in phase one, that uh, that they were trying to capture Kiev uh, and that they were stopped and that they were blunted elsewhere and that wherever they had successes, uh, for instance, in Mariupol down south, uh, they suffered horrendous casualties. Um, the, the truth of the matter is far different. I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that the Russians came in a little overly optimistic uh, that some of their uh, military units uh, were following orders uh, that uh, that uh, along the lines of what's called a, a a a flow of water strategy, because their intelligence services had led them to be that led them to believe that there would be less resistance and more of a compliant um, uh, welcoming by the uh, civilian population of Ukraine. I think this is why we just saw 150 uh, members of the Fifth Department of the uh, FSB. Um, fired and arrested uh, because something went fundamentally wrong there and Russian troops were told to get on the roads and just keep driving. And so they drove through places they shouldn't have driven through. They got into places they shouldn't have been. And the Ukrainian military, which wasn't going to surrender, uh, surrounded them and annihilated them. And so there were significant Russian casualties brought on in these opening moments of the war. Um, the Russian army, however, is not uh, made of glass. It doesn't break the second you hit it. It's made of granite. Uh, it can take a chip or two, and, um, and, and they've adjusted. They adjusted very well. They had a strategy, phase one. Putin said exactly what it is. Uh, it's shaping the battlefield, that the primary focus militarily is the destruction of the Ukrainian military 
located in the Donbas to achieve the total eviction of Ukrainian forces from uh, the territories of Lukansk and uh, Donetsk. But in order to do this, Russia needed to ensure that the rest of the Ukrainian military wasn't in a position to support uh, the defense that would take place there. So these classic military concepts of uh, feint, uh, deception, um, fixing um, come into play. These are these are concepts as old as um, you know ancient Greek warfare when the when the flanks was on the battlefield. And Napoleon mastered it. Uh, it was done in the American Civil War. It was done in World War One. It's done in World War Two. It's been done in every major conflict. I would imagine it was done during the Iraq the Iran Iraq War. Um, yes, that's what I'm going to say. It was done extensively by the Iranians. They would feign an attack here so that they could operate right. elsewhere. Right. And the, the, the object of a feint is to fix an enemy in place, to cause resources to be diverted away from the area of the main attack. Um, I mean, anybody who has studied you know, uh, military history and, and the art of war um, knows this. And the Russian officers are some of the most educated officers in the world. They study this stuff from a young age and they continue to study it throughout their career. So. You know, the idea that Russia would seek to capture a city of 3.1 million people with 50,000 men is ludicrous. But the 50,000 men uh, boldly advancing down uh, would fix between 80 and 100,000 Ukrainian troops in the general Kiev area and compel Ukraine to divert uh, perhaps 40 to 60,000 strategic reserves located in western Ukraine to the Kiev front to stop this uh, Russian front. Now, one thing about a feint is that um, it's usually fought uh, to the disadvantage of the attacker. <laughs> the, the purpose of the feint is not to defeat your enemy. The purpose of the feint is to engage your enemy. And that, in, that process of engagement oftentimes requires you to take casualties. And so there was some heavy fighting in and around Kiev. The Russians did suffer significant casualties. But from a strategic standpoint, they achieved their objective, freezing 100,000 troops in place and compelling 40 to 60,000 more to be diverted. That's a big deal. Um, those are troops that didn't go east. Um, the other thing is down south. You know, the, the Marines uh, floated off of um, uh, off of uh, the, 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 the coast of uh, Odessa, freezing uh, Ukrainian troops there. Um, and then they shaped the battlefield with air power, missile strikes, destroying logistics, command and control, lines of communication, and they inflicted serious casualties on the Ukrainian forces. By the time phase one ended, all 24 mobile brigades of the Ukrainian army had been defeated. And what I mean by defeated doesn't mean destroyed. It means they have lost the capacity for joint combined arms operations with their other units. Their command and control was degraded. Their logistics were whittled down to nothing. And their forces had broken up into um, smaller pocket-sized units that uh, could fight by themselves, but weren't very good at coordinating. Um, and so Russia said, it's time. It's time. It's time to shift to phase two. Phase two means that we are now going to, having shaped the battlefield, frozen forces, degraded forces, we're going to maneuver our forces around. And also another thing, I mean, you've been in war. What happens when you take a military force and you engage in one month straight combat? You guys get tired. Equipment needs to be maintained. Um, you know, there's a thing called rest and refit. It's a normal part of modern military operations. It doesn't mean you lost. It means you're winning. It means you're actually doing great things on the battlefield. But, you know, that tank probably needs to get some maintenance guys in on it or it's going to break. Uh, the soldier probably needs to get some sleep uh, and get some food in them and get a hot shower and feel like a human again. And the command needs to sit back and say, OK, we're refocusing. Let's get our tabletop exercises together. Let's get down to the basics of fighting the war while we maneuver around. And so there's a pause in operations. Ukraine immediately called this pause a strategic victory. They started shouting out the top of their voice how great their victory was, and the Western media parroted it. Part of this victory, of course, was the Russian withdrawal from Kiev. Uh, Russian troops that had been in the area of Bucha uh, for about two weeks uh, left Bucha on, the, I believe, the evening of uh, March 30th, was when they finally withdrew. By March 31st, the uh, mayor of Bucha was saying that we're back. We're back. We've got control of this. 
everything's good. On April 1st, um, there were some disturbing uh, scenes, though. The, um, a, a senior Ukrainian um, government official, a female whose name I don't know, uh, got on local media and the local TV, and she was broadcasting to the citizens of Bucha to stay in your homes. Stay in your home, she said. There is a cleansing operation underway. Do not panic. Now, why would you have to tell people not to panic? Because they're hearing gunfire, perhaps? Now, some people said, well, cleansing doesn't prove anything, except on the same day, the Ukrainian National Police posted on their website that the safari unit was moving through Bucha, carrying out a cleansing operation designed to target Russian collaborators and people who are pro-Russian. Um, now, what does that mean, to cleanse them, to target them? Again, some people say maybe they're just arresting them, except one of the units in the National Police, one belonging to the Azov Battalion, uh, a reconnaissance unit commanded by a guy whose nickname is the Boatsman, and they call him the Boatsman Boys. And they bragged about this, their role in Bucha, by putting a video on the Internet in which you hear them moving through. And one guy says, hey, they're not wearing the blue, the blue being the armband that says I'm on the Ukrainian side. Can I shoot them? And the other guy said, yep, shoot them. All right. So now what we've assembled here is not only the mechanism of inflicting harm on Russian collaborators and Russian uh, pro-Russian elements, but we have intent to inflict harm, command elements saying cleansing operation, and we have evidence of harm being inflicted. So when you evaluate this in the totality and then you see the bodies on the video published by the Ukrainian National Police, you have to know what happened. Everybody knew what happened. When you have bodies with white armbands lying on the ground, some of the bodies had the white armbands removed to use to bind the hands behind their back. So this wasn't the case of somebody coming down the street, seeing movement and shooting. This was the case of somebody coming down the street saying, freeze, you're wearing a white armband, but stroke them in the face, tying them up and popping them in the back of the head. Summary execution. That's exactly what happened. Next to their bodies are the green ration packs that the Russian army issued out to the population of Bucha as a humanitarian gesture. Possession of a green army pack automatically uh, tags you as a pro-Russian collaborator. So the people carrying the green packs with the white armbands were killed. By whom? By the Ukrainian National Police. But now the Ukrainians have a problem because at the same time the story is coming out, videos are appearing online showing the Ukrainians assassinating Russian prisoners of war. Videos are coming online showing the Ukrainians doing horrible things to people. Massive amount of it. It says that the Azov Battalion forgot that it's not, that the internet isn't there for self-entertainment. They forgot that other people watch. And the Ukrainian government had a PR problem, so much so because you have CNN, which is about as pro-Ukrainian as you can get, saying maybe they're killing prisoners of war. When you have the U.S. government saying the Ukrainian government should investigate the possible war crimes carried out. You have the Washington Post publishing a piece that not only talks about prisoners being killed, but about the Ukrainians putting their troops next to civilian areas and saying that's why the damage is being done, because Ukrainians are using human shields, that most of the dead civilians in this conflict aren't the fault of the Russians, but the Ukrainians are using them as human shields. Ukraine has a massive human rights problem. So instantly, the narrative changes in Bucha. Instantly. It's now the greatest war crime in modern history. And it's not. There's more dead bodies under a collapsed building in Mariupol than are lying in the streets of Bucha. I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm not trying to be to denigrate the dead or, or minimize the tragedy. But let's not blow this into genocide. What this was was revenge killing by the Ukrainian National Police. All of the evidence points to that. There were some pathetic efforts to put up satellite imagery by the New York Times, working with a, uh, a civilian satellite company that has very close uh, relations with the U.S. intelligence community for the sole purpose of influencing public opinion. The whole purpose of Matchar, the, the Maxar satellite is to release uh, high-resolution imagery so that the United States doesn't have to declassify its own high-resolution imagery. So it's used to shape public opinion. And they publish a photograph that they claim to be March 19th. And as you rightly said, a body killed on March 19th, sitting out in wet, damp weather, 
40, 50, 60 degrees for 14 days doesn't look like those bodies looked like. Those bodies looked like they were killed within 24 to 36 hours of being found because they were killed within 24 to 36 hours of being found. Had they been killed 14 days ago, they would have been double in size, unrecognizable as human beings, bloated, black, and many of them burst open, putting putrefied, liquefied innards onto the soil next to them. That's the reality. Nobody would be walking down that street because they'd all be throwing up because of the smell. You know this. Anybody who's been involved in war knows this. That's the horrible reality of death. And suddenly the New York Times is telling us that biology, uh, the, the laws of biology no longer apply if you're in Bucha, Ukraine. That bodies decompose at a far slower rate in Bucha, Ukraine, than they do anywhere else in the world. We're supposed to believe it, and guess what? The world did believe it. Nobody's questioning this. Nobody's sitting out there saying, time out. All of the available evidence points only in one direction. There is not a single piece of evidence that exists that points the finger at Russia. None. The only thing that exists about Russia complicity is statements by the Ukrainian government, backed up by the U.S. government, parroted by mainstream media. I know people say, wait, the Germans, they put out those uh, radio intercepts. Well, even the Germans had to admit that what they put out, A, doesn't, they can't geolocate it to Bucha, so they don't know where it happened. And B, they're lying through their teeth because what they're playing aren't intercepted radio conversations. Anybody who's been involved in military communications understands that we use push to talk exclusively. That means if I'm talking to you, Saeed, and I pick up the radio and I go, Saeed, this is Scott, I have to say over and release. So now you can push and say, Scott, this is Saeed. Say what you want, over, release. If we talk over each other, it goes, and we got nothing. But the, 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 the troops released by the Germans have a guy I mean, saying really ridiculous things. Hey, I really want to go into that house and rape and murder the old grandma we saw there the other day. And while he's saying that, the other person said, of course you should do that. They're talking over each other, and we hear both voices. That's a cell phone conversation. That's a cell phone conversation. And if you have trained linguists, listen to this, as I have, I'm not, I have, they ain't Russian speaking. Oh, they're speaking Russian. But when you have a Ukrainian speak Russian, it sounds a whole lot different than when you have a Russian speaking Russian. And what we have on those clips are Ukrainians speaking Russian. So even the pathetic German effort to create evidence against the Russians doesn't work. And then the last question is, what intelligence community, let's say, for instance, they had the one, most wonderful intercept capability. I mean, it would have to be because you're intercepting tactical communications from long distance. According to the Germans, they were doing this from the FLR-9 elephant cage facility located in Augsburg, Germany, and they're picking up cell phone communication. That's a huge technological leap I'd like to see explained to me because I've done SIGIN operations in operational environment and no. But let's say they did it. Are you telling me that the Russian communications aren't encrypted? No, we know they are. So you're telling me you intercepted a tactical communication that was encrypted, you broke the code, and now you're telling the whole world that you did this? And you're releasing information that you claim proves a war crime, but you're doing it in a way that eliminates its utility in a trial. This whole thing stinks and nobody's saying, whoa, I got a question. Please, I, I, I just want some clarification of what's going on here. It's a setup. The media knows it's a setup, but they're doing it. And I had the audacity to put this out on Twitter because I believed that Twitter had the potential of being a forum where a genuine debate, discussion, and dialogue could take place between um, a high-powered, influential, academic, and national security audience uh, that could hopefully bleed over. Now, Ma Max knows better than me. Maybe Al Alistair says he's not Twitter, so there's no... I don't know anything about Twitter's metrics, but I'll, I'll say this. I had three tweets that dealt with Bucha and one that dealt with uh, what we we're talking about, the, the, the strategy. If you have three million impressions, is that good or bad? I think it's OK. It's not the best. I'm sure there's people out there that have better impressions. But to, to put out a tweet and then to find out later that day that you have two million impressions, I think it means you're having an impact. I think it means that people are listening, people are paying attention. There's some sort of participatory uh, thing going on. Um, 
And this was a threat. This was a threat. This could not be allowed to stay. So I, I was banned. Uh, we protested the first ban, and they banned me for the same thing. I, I got banned twice for the same thing, just daring to challenge the, the narrative of Bucha. Now my voice is permanently eliminated from Twitter. Congratulations, America. You claim to be a democracy, and yet you stifle the very debate, discussion, and dialogue necessary to inform an audience so they can hold people accountable for what they do in their name. That's what a democracy is about, and Twitter just killed it. Well, uh, yeah, so I, I was quite surprised at how fast you, you, you're, you're, you only, there were only a couple of tweets. I just, it wasn't as if you were going on and on and on about the topic either. So, um, but, but Max, one thing that I, I, that's really important for me, it so, sort of goes back, goes to the question that I asked first. Uh, I asked Alistair, and that is the future. I remember when the, the sanctions for, were first imposed, Biden spoke and sort of gloated, saying that the, the ruble is collapsing, and I think he even exaggerated the collapse. Uh, but the, the ruble rebounded, and I know Alistair knows a lot about economics, but it rebounded. And uh, But I'm sure, as Scott was saying, that the, the Russian economy is hurting very hard. The Iranian economy has been hurting for years now because of sanctions. But of course, Russia is much larger than Iran. Russia exports much more energy and it's um, it has a larger popula population and, and a lot of key metals and, and other raw materials come from Russia. So my question is that who is going to get hit the hardest? Because I, I personally think that the EU and the and Correct me if I'm wrong. The EU and the US sacrifice Ukraine in their fight against Russia to weaken Russia. But I think the R Americans are not just sacrificed. The EU and the US were sacrificing Ukraine, but I think the Americans were sacrificing the EU and Ukraine in their fight against Russia. But does the, but does the United States actually win? Because with the global economic crisis that has begun long ago, 2008, 2009, quantitative easing, then um the coronavirus and now who is going to be hit the hardest is it going to be western countries the whole of nato the united states europe or russia who 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 is hit the most and hit the hardest as a result of this uh, economic warfare ukraine aside the battlefield uh scott spoke about the fact that the russians are doing much better than the western media is claiming but economically speaking who who takes the hardest hit and by the way i'm going to turn off my camera for a second because i've been fasting so i'm going to be eating for a couple of minutes while you speak well i i did i i forgot about the uh the time zone issue if i had known i was uh holding up your meal i would feel more guilty about this uh i'm gonna make a i guess i'll make a few comments uh, on to your question, I'll address Bucha because we've been kind of putting together an analysis of what we think is happening. And then I have to uh, jump off myself. Um, how do you quantify a hard hit to a country and a people? Uh, that that sort of is the, the question here. Iran has a resistance economy. It has a population that lived through the Iran-Iraq war, which you yourself fought, or fought in as a frontline soldier, Mohammed, that steals you against all sorts of adversity. And you develop a different culture when you are under siege, surrounded by various aspects of empire, uh, Iraq being one at that time. And then you have the Russian population. Um, I, you know, had a brief, I had a, I had a, like a, sh a short interaction with Russians. I was in Moscow for a few days and I got to talk to people on Red Square. Um, and I talked to as many as I could and it was clear that they had a very different mentality than my fellow Americans, particularly in my generation, and that they were accustomed to this sense of siege. Um, 
Some of them actually did remember World War II that were old enough to have remembered. A woman I spoke to actually expressed nostalgia for Stalin, something that I think a lot of Americans couldn't imagine. A young woman led me around uh, parts of Moscow who spoke English and spoke of uh, economic hardship and uh, sort of a, a fairly grim situation that people were just soldiering through. And this was their reality, uh, but it was far better than the 1990s. The, so from a cultural standpoint, America, the United States and its population has a lot to lose. And so does Europe. And Europe is far more in, in a far more economically precarious situation than the United States. The United States knows that. And I do believe there is an element within the U.S. foreign policy establishment that wants to weak, that seeks to keep Europe weak. In fact, that is really the essence of NATO, which is to keep Germany from being a dominant power, a dominant regional power, to keep Russia out and to keep the United States in control of Europe. And you can actually see Macron uh, in his constant conversations with Putin, sort of bridling a little bit while the U.S. seeks to uh, well, essentially stymie any negotiations or peace talks. Olaf Scholz clearly made a huge mistake when he went to Munich puffing his chest out at the Munich Security Conference before the conflict erupted into open warfare. And now I think he might want to walk it back. His coalition could collapse. His government could collapse. Prices are up 50 percent in German markets. And, you know, I've been ac across the country since February 24th, witnessing what Joe Biden calls the Putin price hike, something that no American accepts, no normal American accepts that it that we need to have higher gas prices, which are now going down a little bit. And they're now, what, six dollars and twenty five cents per gallon of regular. No American accepts that that's necessary in order to show resolve to Putin. That is a an, an elite neoconservative mentality that's only prevalent inside the beltway. And maybe uh, Sean Penn out here in Los Angeles seems to um, seems to believe that this Hollywood actor, he fantasized about taking up arms against Russia while he was filling up his car in Brentwood, which is a wealthy neighborhood here in Los Angeles, where I am right now. But no normal American accepts that. So you have the potential for massive anger and outrage in the United States and in Europe at the present order because of the decisions they made. And I should mention that inflation was already spiking massively in the United States prior to February 24th. And the Biden administration and their message was that and the Fed, what they were saying was, this is transitory. It's going to go away. We're going to get inflation down. Consumer prices will go down and everything will be fine. Maybe after midterms, that's not going to happen. We now know that this is kind of the current reality. And many people believe that we are undergoing a kind of great economic reset where this is a permanent reality where things they uh, believe were that they could take for granted as Americans before, like having meat every night will no longer be possible. Uh, the having cheap food, the whole concept of the American way of life, which they honor uh, over the PA system at Yankees Stadium before each baseball game is gone and that they are now existing in a world where elites only enjoy those privileges, hovercraft elites, and they will be told to eat lab grown meats instead of actual meat, that they will be told that they uh, will own nothing and be happy. Uh, and the reality is that for most people younger than me, they will be renting for the rest of their lives and will not be able to own homes and, or they will be living with their parents. So the American way of life we're watching disappear before our eyes. In the near term, this will benefit politically right wing populists in the United States and Europe who have no love for NATO. In the United States, that would be the Make America Great Coalition that supported Donald Trump. And they, while they may not um, have any affinity or solidarity for people in Iran, people in the Middle East, uh, while they may even be Islamophobic, they are not interested in sending American troops to fight and die in these foreign wars. And their constituents are the ones who 
experienced the moral and physical injury of the war in Iraq, while the coastal intelligentsia sat there with soft hands and knew nothing of the suffering of the enlisted men and women in the U.S. military. So they will gain in the midterm elections in the United States. They will gain in coming European elections. I'm, we're talking in Europe about like the uh, alternative for Deutschland. We're seeing uh, Marine Le Pen and her National Front rise. Uh, figures like Eric Zemmour coming to the surface in France uh, and all across Western Europe. And that will deepen the polarization. It will accelerate. It already is acceler intensifying the urge among the liberal establishment for more censorship and more authoritarian members to hold back what they call populism. Um, overall, just on the world stage, I think this does. Up, uh, I think this is part of the dawn of a multipolar world um, where the empire no longer has a, a unified population or a uh, or th that believes in the myths of American exceptionalism to provide a constituency to support these kind of imperial adventures. And right now, the main constituency for confronting Russia is uh, sort of. I don't know if this will translate well in Iran, but liberal wine moms, um, sort of uh, people who, you know, might have had um, Obama stickers on their Toyota Prius hybrid vehicles, uh, people who might have had Black Lives Matter signs on their front lawns now want to send javelin missiles to the neo-Nazi Azov battalion. It's a very strange situation here. And you see these tough guys, you know, who support Trump. Um, expressing just disgust with the, with the pressure for the war, questioning the psyops, questioning the establishment, um, and so yeah, we're in a a very unusual situation here in the United States that I think really is worth paying attention to if you can in uh, uh, from Tehran because it will greatly affect your your um, political posture. I think. I would like to hear from Mohammed uh, before I go. Um, we've seen this massive walk back from the Biden administration on Venezuela. They sent the team down there to negotiate. I know there were elements in the State Department that tried to sabotage this. That's sort of a separate story. But the White House was desperate to get Venezuelan crude. Um, it's really important for, for, for powering you know, diesel vehicles. U.S. liquid natural gas has so many problems, um, and it seems like the Biden administration wants to do a redo of the JCPOA just to get Iranian oil to offset the loss of Russian oil, which accounted for something like 7 to 10 percent of the U.S. oil market. Biden was hoping to do this by the midterms, and that doesn't seem like it's going to happen. But does, but does the uh, Iranian administration even have any interest in this anymore? Um, and, 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 you know, is Venezuela going to, uh, you know, offer the U S any of the terms it's seeking? I mean, can they, just, they, the, the U S seems like it's in a very weak negotiating position here. Yes, I, I agree. I think the U S is in a very weak negotiating position and that's perhaps one reason why we still don't have a nuclear deal. The way I see it is that. Um, the gradual decline of the United States, uh, which is its own fault, regardless of the economic model, but the, the constant wars in the region, the cost that trillions of dollars wasted in Iraq and the trillions wasted in Afghanistan and elsewhere have depleted the U.S. economy. And I would argue that the country and, and that benefits the most from the weakening of the United States in our part of the world is Iran, as well as its allies. And what happens in Ukraine, regardless of how horrible war is, and I've been to Iraq, I've been to Musa the, the day it was liberated, I've been to Aleppo when it was uh, when it was being liberated, eastern Aleppo. I, I hate war, but um, the, the conflict in Ukraine um, weakens the United States and therefore by extension it strengthens Iran. Right now Iran 
for a, a, a relatively long period of time now. Iran has been selling it its oil at full capacity, and uh, it's all of its reserves that were in uh, old tankers stuck in the middle of the, of the sea because they couldn't find buyers. All of them have been sold uh, on the spot market at you know very high prices. The money coming in quickly. Countries are coming to Iran for better relations because they need Iranian energy and also because uh, other countries have to start choosing sides. So for China, for Russia, uh, they know that the Israelis, the Saudi, the Israeli regime, the Emirati regime, the Saudi regime, and others, if they are forced to choose, they're probably not going to choose anything but the United States. So the Russians, the Chinese need Iran more than before. And so Iran is more enabled, but and I think that is one reason why uh, Biden has is is not ending, is not concluding the deal. I think that he, he feels weak, he looks weak, and his antagonists are pushing him, including the Israeli lobby, and therefore, and but still I would say it's in the interest of the United States to conclude a deal, the smart, because as time goes by, I think that the United States and Europe are going to continue to be weakened as a result of all these pressures and, and the war itself. And this is as oil, oil and gas still flow from Russia. So, uh, the, the the problems that you are alluding to in in gasoline being what 650 uh, a gallon or or something like that that is as the oil flows as the gas flows we still don't have that sort of break that some people are oddly enough hoping for so I, I think that Iran is in a very strong position much more so than it was even three four months ago. Uh, even though, as I said, I feel that Iran has been empowered. I, I, I think it's it's getting late for all of you. I know all of you have things to do. Uh, Max, you've said so uh, explicitly. I think uh, Scott has its lunchtime and Alistair told me he doesn't want to be around too late. I just want all three of you to give some concluding remarks as brief as you like. I, I just want to make a comment here, and I, I find it fascinating that Europe and the United States, they're supporting Nazis or neo-Nazis or fascists or whatever they want to call them or others want to call them in Ukraine. But they, they're ignoring the fact that as a result of all these wars and all the immigrants coming in and the collapse of the middle class, that the right wing is rising in their own societies. And that the more they enable extremists in Ukraine, the more dangerous it is for their own security. And that reminds me exactly of what they did with ISIS and Al Qaeda and Jaish al Islam in Syria. You use these weapons, these tools, these extremists, these monsters uh, to gain some sort of advantage over your adversaries. But ultimately, they, you cannot control them, and populations become influenced by them, and the threat spreads to areas that I think Mr. Erdogan, for one, never expected this. The blowback for him, it continues today. So you know, I, I just thought that this is quite extraordinary that the Europeans would do the same thing so close to home. But if you could all give me some concluding remarks, Alistair, if I could begin with you. And if I've said anything that's wrong, please correct me. Back. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to the sort of bigger picture again um, and talk about uh, uh, what that means for America. What happened to the picture? For the United States. Uh, the I thought you were initiating some sort of peace movement there. Well, something happened, but I don't know what. <laughs> There are too many buttons on this um, sort of form, I think. Anyway, I hope I haven't given anyone the wrong ideas. <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting peace is coming at all. In fact, what I was going to say was that, you know, actually the, the crux of the problem that we're in is the economic one, insofar as I think inadvertently 
um, a small team of staffers in the White House decided this was a great idea, not only to try and create a sort of raid on the ruble and to crush it and a bank run at the same time, um, just as they did in 2014 with compliance from you know hedge funds and from Wall Street uh, and to sink it and then create the political upheaval that would see Putin gone. But in so doing, they made this big mistake of seizing the reserves of Russia, spooking the rest of the world about holding those reserves and effectively saying that US treasuries are not money good, that they are no longer valid as money for if you're on the wrong side of Washington. Again, it's given people a real pause for thought, and we're going to see a lot of outflow, I think, of foreign exchanges. But it's more than that. Russia responded in a way, and Europe didn't expect this either. You will remember the French finance minister right back at March said, we're going to collapse the Russian economy. It's going to be a disaster for them. And look where we are now, with the ruble back above the rate it was at the beginning of the conflict. Uh, we see the, ba the banks, the financial systems uh, more or less stabilized. The stock market is working. The, the industrial production was rising in this period. Inflation is at about 14.7% but coming down. And actually, the Russian economy is in a better position than Europe's now paradoxically. And this has left Europe and America in a real crux because, you know, the aim was to do this by, you know, treasury nuclear war, to crap, you know, to remove Putin, to weaken Russia by financial means, no boots in the ground, no major NATO involvement at all, and we do it. And then it doesn't work. So what is the narrative? And this is a narrative we hear in Europe all the time now. And they say, well, it's because Germany still buys gas from Russia and so do others in Europe. And that means that Russia is getting almost a billion dollars a day to finance its war machine. This is Zelensky's story, of course, and it's having an effect. And Europe is sort of gradually moving towards this position. But what happens when that doesn't work? And that's where I think we're going because Europe is counting. It can't cope without Russian gas and oil. It just can't do it. Ask any experts. I know there are think tanks that say, oh, yes, it's possible. Don't believe them. Ask any energy company and they'll tell you it's just not possible. And Olaf Scholz and Macron think, oh, look, it's going to be so effective, such a knockout blow that, you know, Putin will be gone and we'll have a compliant man in Moscow and we'll get back our, our, our oil and gas at discount rates by the autumn before the cold comes and makes Europeans unhappy. And it's not going to happen. And this is my concern, really, because you already hear new noises coming from America, from various quarters. Kagan has now upbraided his argument, which was before, that he was right all along, that America needed to have a military exercise. What's wrong with using the military, he keeps saying. Now there's a new version that's just come out in these recent days, which says, look, not only should we use our military, we, there should be a military solution to Russia and Ukraine, but we shouldn't worry about nukes. Why are we worrying about the fact that Russia has got nuclear power? They won't use it. Putin would never do that. So we can just ignore it and we can use massive NATO can become involved in Ukraine. I just think that, you know, the West, partic Britain particularly, has, you know, escalated this frenzy of hatred and a sense of these outrages and daily killings and butchery committed by Russians, you know, it's very hard to put these back in the bottle. Very hard. That's what our point I was trying to make. You know, they're not intended to be put back in the bottle. They're conceived, so you don't, not able to put them back in the bottle. However much hard detective work that Scott does and others, you know, they'll get up and they'll rubbish it. 
So it's not meant. So where is Europe going? First of all, the economic costs of this mean that Europe is going to be just relegated to a small backwater of the economy. Its economies, its industrials will be uncompetitive buying high expensive gas from the United States. I mean, finish for German industry. They know that and that's why they're complaining so on. But inflation, someone mentioned, Scott, I think mentioned, 50% price increases here in Italy, 20% increases um, in food prices. It's astonishing the, the increase in prices. And we haven't got started on this yet. Uh, what is going to be the consequence? Now, actually, I disagree with Mohammed on this, rarely, but I do on this when he said it's going to promote the right, um, the extreme right in, in, in Europe. Actually, the totalitarianism is in the governments, is in Brussels, is in Rome and in Paris with these, um, if you like, uh, liberal integrationists who will remove all other narratives. Max was complaining about the United States here in Italy. I'm not allowed to watch RT. I'm not allowed to listen to Sputnik. I get nothing you can't get onto the Kremlin site. Any alternative voice out of Russia is crushed. Look at the European press. Not a word, not a word that doesn't comport with the, with the government line, with a narrative of you know, of Russia having made a terrible mess of this conflict, Putin is going to be thrown out of office by disaffection in his country. We've only got to give up our, our gas for a few months in the summer when we don't need it anyway, and it will all be solved. Well, it isn't. And where are we going to go next? And I don't see any leadership. I don't see anyone of the stature in Europe capable uh, of pulling this back. I mean, Olaf Scholz, I mean, first of all, he's got a problem with his coalition, but he just doesn't have the, the stature. Macron doesn't have the stature. These people don't have agency. They don't convince Putin anyway that they've got, you know, the steel in them to actually make a difference. So I think we're heading into a, a period, and I hinted at that at the beginning, where we're going to see you know, the, the clash and the escalation uh, continuing and, and rising because, you know, Brussels, you know, they've had it for so easy for so long. They've been so used to getting their way. They've never had to make hard decisions all the time I worked. And I worked in Brussels for nine years in the, uh, uh, the high representative's cabinet, the foreign policy, foreign minister of the European Union. You never took hard decisions. You always fudge it. You always kick the can down the road. This is known as Merkelism for, for good reasons, whereby Europe never can make a difficult decision. It always fudges it. It always moves it on. It always puts a little bit of money into the system to try and make it smoother. And so Europe is heading to a, a really bad outcome. They tried their last effort with the Austrian chancellor going there probably at Olaf Scholz's request to see if they could get a sort of little buyout for the gas problem for a few months, that they could go on taking energy from Russia for a little bit more because Germany desperately needs it to keep the industrial uh, party quiet. They want, they want a little bit of that. Are they going to give a ceasefire, a, a, a sort of Easter ceasefire? Of course not. Putin just said absolutely no way, nothing. And I'm through with talking to Zelensky. And Medvedev said, anyway, Zelensky, I mean, who are these freaks trying to, you know, want? We don't talk with these people, uh, talk with these people uh, a anymore. And Lavrov was scathing in his reaction to it. And so this is puts, you know, um, the European elites and the Americans, they put themselves in this position where they face economic ruin. They face economic ruin. And it put them in this position thinking there was an easy victory to be had through the financial warfare. And it's not coming, hasn't come, it's not going to come at all in this period. And so where do they go now? Putting in a little, you know, 
giving a few two or three S three hundreds across the border to go and attack it, what happened? Poof, they've gone the next day, Russia's destroyed them. They want to put a few tanks across, fifty tanks to make up for the one and a half thousand that have been destroyed by the Russians. Poof, they'll be gone the next day. You know, there's no easy answer for Europe with all these gestures that they're coming to and then so America has got to face the prospect of a major, major political diplomatic defeat. And is it going to cope with that? Is Europe going to cope with that? It will change the landscape in Europe. Mohammed's absolutely right. It'll change the landscape in right. But actually, the forces that are against it are the ones that want to see this elite this neoliberal integrationist pro-NATO, pro-EU elites in Europe out. That's what we saw a bit in in the uh, French election and what we're seeing that's happening in, in Europe. They're the totalitarians. They're the ones who won't accept document. They're the ones suppressing politi political parties in Europe. They're the ones that claim to be democratic and are absolutely the reverse from democratic. Mohammed. Thanks, Alistair. Scott, any ideas you'd like to discuss? I'm find the unmute button there. Um, well, first of all, again, I, I always enjoy um, coming after Alistair because I, all I could do is just sit here and nod my head and say what he said. Um, I'll, I'll expand on certain aspects of it, though. Um, just to bring it down into areas that I'm I'm more comfortable talking about, and that's the military. Um, I think we 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 need to understand a couple of things. One, Russia, you know, has been building a modern military. They've always had effective military doctrine, but that doctrine has always been coupled to a very large, um, wieldy, conscript, heavy army. But since um, 2014, actually, they've been transforming their military into um, something that um, is far more professional and far more capable and far more technologically advanced than anybody in the West gives it credit for. Uh, we still, you still hear people talking about, you know, all the conscripts. Uh, 75, 77 percent of the Russian military are composed of what they call contract soldiers. In America, we call them all volunteers. Uh, in, in Russia, there's professional soldiers, guys who sign four, six, eight year contracts. Uh, and they're very well trained, very well led, very well equipped. Russia has been struggling with um, the the issue of of what in America we would call the organized reserve. And there's two issues. One, how do you how do you build such a thing? How do you train them? How do you how do you make it functional? And two, the politics of it, because Russia isn't the the, the Soviet Union with this massive standing army. Uh, their army has actually been significantly reduced. Um, you know, maybe 900,000 troops who, who have to defend a very large country. So it's not like it can bring all 900,000 down to uh, down, to, down to Europe. But um, so they have a reserve. And, and and one of the questions that people ask when they when they when Russia talked about this is, well, what are the political ramifications of mobilizing your reserve? I mean, that you know, you're you're creating something that will be impossible to to actually implement because there will be huge rejection and, and response, demonstrations in the street. You know, the United States fought in Vietnam. We never mobilized the reserve because all our presidents were scared of this. Vladimir Putin just mobilized 60,000 reserves. The boys are right now going to their initial training to get re-equipped, re reorganized, and ready to rock. He's our frontline troops, though. These guys aren't going to be leading the assault. They're not there as combat replacements, although some of them might be. But the majority of them are there to do what's called rear area security. And what does that mean? That means when Vladimir Putin stood before the world and said, this thing ain't over till it's over, it'll be over when I say it's over on the terms that I dictate, that means that it's all over for Ukraine. This war won't end until Ukraine is defeated as a nation. Zelensky won't have the opportunity to negotiate a peace treaty. If he's lucky enough to be alive when this is done, he'll have a peace treaty negotiated to him, unconditional surrender, unconditional surrender. And what, what comes along with this total victory is Russia's now going to total control of the narrative. 
you know, in the West, we've been told that the Nazi element is just, it's been overplayed. Azov is just a minor element. Don't worry about it. They're not, they're not as bad as they want. Russia is in the process. And, and I've picked up on this and I, I think um, maybe Max has, maybe Alistair has. Um, they're, you know, they keep talking about the International Criminal Court and, uh, and people sending people over to investigate war crimes. Russia has mobilized the totality of its prosecutorial force. And they're in the process of taking statements as we speak of every prisoner of war they've captured. They are evaluating reams of documents. And when this war finishes, they will have control of everything. They'll have captured high profile people. They'll have the documents. They'll have the history. They'll know the collusion between the government and the Nazis. And they will hold a military tribunal, the likes of which the world hasn't seen since the end of the Second World War. And when they do this, you're going to see the reality of modern day Ukraine put out before the world. Now, of course, if they did that today, we have a situation where the Western controlled media would reject it, would say, well, no, it's not real. We'll cancel everybody on Twitter who claims it's real, and we won't talk about it. But the media is a reflection of society. And I think we've alluded to the fact that Europe is about to fundamentally change. There are people right now who are willing to listen to the Russian perspective, who are being silenced right now, who are about to become politically empowered. I can guarantee you that France will not be turning off RT after April 24th if Marie Le Pen wins. I can guarantee that Germany won't be turning off RT when the Schultz government collapse, as it will inevitably because of what the Schultz government has done. And the point I'm getting at is we are looking at a transformational moment, I believe, in how information is going to be processed by the global community. Because once the unity of the shouting down the Russian position collapses and the legitimacy of the Russian position is exposed, you're going to see a whole bunch of people. Um, with mud on their faces. This isn't going to be WMD and Iraq mud on their face because there were no consequences to those who lied about the, the, you know, the, the, the case for war in Iraq. This is going to be Europe shamed by the fact that they facilitated the, an odious ideology, one that my grandfathers and the grandfathers of many Americans traveled overseas to fight a life and death struggle against. You know, Nazism is, 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 it cannot be tolerated. And, and to say that the Ukrainians are innocent is like saying that the United States decided tomorrow that we're going to take all these white supremacist militias that exist in the United States and we're going to formally turn them into battalions and integrate them intact into the U.S. military so that we have now official racist units in the U.S. military. But don't worry, the U.S. military is not a racist organization, nor is the United States a racist nation. No. If you have functioning racist units in your military, you're a racist organization and you're a racist country. Ukraine is a neo-Nazi facilitating country that has embraced the, the ideology of Stepan Bandera uh, as, as they call it nationalism, but it's not. It's the same ideology that saw millions of Jews killed at the hands. And it's not just in Ukraine. This is the point I'll, I'll leave with. This ideology exists in Poland. This ideology exists in the Baltics. This ideology exists in Austria, in Hungary, in other nations. Europe is about to have the, the, the curtain revealed on the fact that it is a fundamentally broken continent. It ha it's not the bastion of democracy that people think it is. It actually has retained the kernel of the kind of nationalistic, anti-Semitic hatred that led to the creation of Nazi Germany and Russia's in the business of killing Nazis and business is good. It's going to be good for some time now. I think Europe needs to wake up to the fact that they have awoken, they have woken a bear, a big bear who's angry. Anger that comes from losing 23 to 32 million people in a war against nationalist socialism. Russia has never forgotten this. Russia will never forgive those who give voice to Nazi ideology. This is a huge deal that the West isn't focused on. We tend to poo-poo it as Russian propaganda. No, it's in the DNA of every Russian alive today. This is why Vladimir Putin is popular, because he's doing something that every Russian agrees with, which is stamping out the ideology that brought so much death, destruction, and pain to the Russian people back in the Second World War. And I think this is going to redefine 
um, Europe going forward, both in terms of how news is made, news is received, and how governments, um, you know, manage. I'd like to see Europe actually go the route of Iran, and I'll leave it with this. You know, I'm not saying Iran's perfect. You're not. You know it. Everybody knows it. Just like the United States isn't perfect. I'm not saying that Iran has freedom of speech. You don't. But I will tell you this. In the lead up to the JCPOA uh, being um, confirmed back in 2015, Iran engaged in what I thought was a very wide open debate that sometimes turned into fistfights <laughs> about this policy. And it was an open discussion and nothing was barred. Everything was on the table. Everybody talked about it. If you were an Iranian citizen, you could see it on TV. You could read about it in the papers. You could go to your cafe or your restaurants. You could have people in your home. And this was a line of discussion. It's a healthy debate. And it empowered the Iranian people to survive what has come because nothing has taken them by surprise. In the West, we deceived ourselves about what the JCPOA was. But there was no deception in Iran. Everybody knew what it was. Everybody knew what to expect so that when the United States did what Iran predicted it was due, nobody in Iran went, oh, we're sorry. And you know where else they had that kind of debate and discussion? In Russia. We don't want to admit it. Is Russia perfect? Not at all. Do they have freedom of speech? Not even close. But they have more informed debates about critical issues of importance to the Russian people than we have here in the United States and is ongoing in Europe today. And one of the consequences of this conflict, which Russia is going to win decisively, is that it's going to strip away the veneer of the artifice of freedom of speech. And people are going to realize that one of the reasons why Europe is facing the problems they're facing today and America is facing the problems they had is that we don't have freedom of speech. We've been denied the opportunity to have that in-depth national discussion about issues of importance. And I do believe that the American people and your people are going to be enraged. And it's going to change the way that information is going to be transmitted and received by the government, and by the people going forward. That's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. And Max, what are your thoughts? It's a hard act to follow. Um, you know, I, I don't have much to add. I would just point out that the United States is justifying its aggressive support for Ukraine, uh, which includes a recent meeting with eight CEOs of the main arms industry uh, corporations in which they are being primed to produce in record time and with uh, aggressive capacity new weapons for the Ukrainian military or what's left of it, uh, which includes uh, a constant a constant blizzard of propaganda in the media and from the Biden administration, um, that they're justifying this all based on the idea that Ukraine is a threatened democracy. They've sort of transferred the narrative, uh, the Israeli or Zionist narrative about Israel being a democracy surrounded by uh, tyrannical bar barbarians onto Ukraine. And actually, if you listen to Ukrainian officials uh, who speak English present their case, they sound very similar to Israeli officials, uh, including in their uh, exterminationist language about the enemy. Um, this is a complete fantasy. And the idea that there's a moral case for not just supporting the Ukrainian military effort, but for waging an economic war on, Ru on Russia that has had terrible blowback for Europe and the United States. The, the, this idea is being exposed every day. Yesterday, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky announced the arrest of Viktor Medvedchuk, who is his main rival, uh, the main opposition figure in Ukraine. He's presented as pro-Russian. He is the godfather of uh, so, uh, I believe Putin is the godfather of his daughter, um, but his for life party or Patriots for Life party has been an integral part of the Ukrainian polity since its existence and represents the ethnic Russian population of Ukraine in 
a way that uh, that differs from, for example, the United Russia Party that uh, Putin led for for many years. It's not advancing Russia as uh, the ruler of Ukraine. It is uh, putting forward the interests of a population that represents something like 30 percent or large plurality of the Ukrainian population. They have been officially disenfranchised. Medvedchuk was arrested. It appears that he was beaten by the Ukrainian SBU, which has been trained in torture tactics that it's been put on display for years by the CIA. Um, Medvedchuk had his television stations shut down last year. And all of this is being done with the encouragement of the Biden administration. The U.S. Embassy in Kiev openly supported shutting down Medvedchuk's uh, TV stations and called them Russian disinformation. Thirteen political parties have been banned by Vladimir Zelensky, all of them left wing, representative of the ethnic Russian population or Eurosceptic. So I can imagine there was a, a U.S. endorsement for these parties as well. Leftists in the city of Dnipro have been kidnapped in a massive wave of repression by the Ukrainian SBU. Many of them are being beaten. One uh, told the German publication Junge Welt that uh, this that the war is a cover for eliminating all left wing opposition to Zelensky's government. Um, a way mayors are missing all across Ukraine. One mayor named Vladimir Strok from the city of Kremina was shot in the heart after calling for negotiations and a diplomatic settlement with Russia. The advisor to the Ukrainian Ministry of Internal Affairs, Anton Garashenko, celebrated Strzok's death on his Telegram channel and said there is one less traitor in Ukraine. Um, I can go down the line on these mayors who are being assassinated. Um, another one is um, Yuri Polipko of Gostomel which was a city that was in the Kiev Oblast and saw harsh, uh, heavy fighting between Ukrainian forces and Russian forces. And he had reportedly entered into negotiations with the Russian military for a civilian corridor, something that the neo-Nazi battalions integrated into the Ukrainian National Guard would hate to see because they lose their collateral when the civilians go away. Mohammed, you also saw that take place in Syria and places under control of the um, NATO-backed militias like Jaysh al-Islam and Jaysh al-Fatah, etc. Prilipko was um, found murdered. Uh, Gennady Matsegora, he's the mayor of a town in northeastern Ukraine called Kupiansk, and he released a video pleading to Vladimir Zelensky and the Ukrainian SBU to release his daughter, who has been held hostage by the SBU because he attempted to negotiate with Russia to save his city. And then you have Denis Kariv, who is a top member of the Ukrainian negotiating team, who was killed after returning from Minsk in broad daylight in Kiev after the first round of talks uh, with Russia. And he was accused of treason in the Ukrainian media. All of this is being blessed personally by Vladimir Zelensky, the hero of the United States right now, a figure who is uh, superseded Anthony Fauci as the the you know heartthrob of liberal America. Zelensky said that there will be consequences for collaborators, and when you have the highest levels of government sanctioning executions and assassinations of local officials, banning all opposition, banning all opposition media, you do not have a democracy. But this country, Ukraine, is being supported by the United States on the grounds that it shares values with our own country. I would say it does indeed share values with the U.S. It in fact, it in fact was essentially this post-Maidan regime was created by the U.S. as a oligarchy with neo-Nazi ultranationalist enforcement. And that bears a lot of similarities uh, to the country, unfortunately, that could be coming into view uh, right outside my window. So it's important to keep a, a clear head and to call out 
to, to just present reality as it is here. That's why I think this forum was really important and why I think so many of us are facing the threat of censorship. I, I should mention, um, you know, because Scott has been censored and Alistair wisely stays out of the world of social media that, you know, I've been approached by a journalist from a popular neocon tabloid publication in the U.S. who seems to be working on a piece that is going to make the case for me to be removed from social media as well. So that's why I think it's important to have these discussions and also to continue to build bridges between our populations, between the U.S. population and our brothers and sisters in Iran who are um, still unfortunately living under sanctions and the threat of war. Um, so hopefully these bridges can lead to a different reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems like, you know, all these years we've been hearing about regime change operations and toppling governments one after another. Another and now the chickens may be coming home to roost. So we'll have to see how things play out in Europe and in, in the United States. Things are not looking very good. I've actually been removed from Facebook and Instagram a long time ago. So I'm just waiting till I join Scott and then maybe Max can join us <laughs> later too. But uh, I'll meet you. I'll meet you guys on Telegram. Oh, well, I, I probably should should join. But uh, and hopefully we'll 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 meet in person at some point, maybe in Tehran, and then we can have a uh, a town hall conversation here. In any case, I'm very grateful to all three of you. It was an uh, excellent opportunity provided to us by the Institute for North American and European Studies at the University of Tehran, and I hope hope to speak to all three of you again soon. And uh, thanks a lot. I know you've been busy, and thanks for making the time. Uh, thank you for arranging it, Mohammed. Thank you. Bye thank for you now. Bye.